Hi, thank you for joining us today. My name is Dylan and I am an Analytics Specialist Solutions Architect with AWS. I am joined by Marvin Gershow, who is a Startup Solutions Architect. In today's talk, we're going to discuss how startup customers are building their data infrastructure on AWS. Let's look at today's agenda. Firstly, we will discuss why is it hard for our customer to turn data into insights. Then we will talk about at a high level, what are the things we need to do. After that, Marvin will take over and tell us the two most common design patterns to build out a batch processing layer on AWS. The reason we're focusing on batch processing layer today is that that is the most common place for our customers to start their data journey. After that, Marvin will also walk us through how to extend your batch processing layer to a more comprehensive modern data architecture. Let's get started. Our customers want more value from their data. However, they're running into several challenges. Our customer's data is growing exponentially. It's very common for our customer to have terabytes to petabytes of data. Traditional on-premises uh, data analytic approaches cannot handle this data volumes well because they don't scale very well and are too expensive. Our customers are also ingesting data from new sources. They're not only getting data from their traditional and non-traditional databases, but they're also gathering clickstream data, um, application logs, and also ingesting data from the SaaS products that they're using. As a result, our customer's data platform needs to support um, more diverse uh, data formats. So they need to not only support structured and semi-structured data, but also non-structured data like PDF files and video clips. This is not the end of the story. On the consumer side, modern data infrastructure is used uh, by more and more personas and needs to support more and more use cases. It is very common for modern data architecture to expose um, BI interface so that business users can make use of the data. And also on top of that, it needs to support SQL interface so that data analysts can explore the data set that they have. And then it also needs to support notebook environments so that machine uh, data scientists can train and build machine learning workload on your data set. Last but not least, it also needs to expose API endpoint so the data can be analyzed by different applications. So how do our customers solve all these challenges? It is very common for our customers to build data pipelines that transform the data from one stage to another based on their needs. In today's talk, we will um, talk about one common pattern of the data pipeline and break out the transformation into three different stages. The first stage is what we call as the raw data zone. As you can see on this diagram, we have all the different data sources on the left hand side, including internal databases, external data set, and also log data and sensor data. As you can see, the characteristics of raw data is that it comes as it is. As data infrastructure team, typically you want to impose as little limitations to the ingestion data sources as possible so that it's easier for them to um, push data onto your platform. As a result, all different source system will ingest the data at their own cadence. You might get structured, semi-structured, and non-structured data. And also it's very common that there is no guarantee of the data quality that you get. There might be random upper stream system bugs happening from time to time, and there can also be unnotified um, schema changes. On top of that, if you are supporting multiple data sources, it's very common to have schema mismatch between all these sources. As a result, uh, data in the raw data zone is typically not that useful for the end consumers. So our customer needs to transform the data from the raw data zone 
into what we call a prepared data zone. Typical transformations include uh, data cleansing and schema validation so that the data in the prepared data zone is trustworthy. Our customer will also flatten semi-structured data and parsing out important uh, information from non-structured data, store that into the format like uh, Parquet so that it's more efficient for distributed data processing uh, application. And it's also very common to have one-to-one -one table mapping between the tables in the raw data zone and the tables in the prepared data zone so that the business atomic get maintained. It is very common for our uh, customer to expose the prepared data zone to internal um, development team and also power users who are interested in diving deep into the individual tables. But this is not the end of the journey. Our customer um, typically will transfer the data from the prepared zone into a consumable zone. So the characteristics of the data in consumable data zone is that all the tables are built, are built as needed. So typical transformations include uh, table joins between different data sources so that the target result is laser focused to the application need. And also it includes um, table aggregations so that you will expose the data at the right format and the right granularity. And on top of that, you will uh, expose the data using the right interface facing the, uh, fitting the customer's technology. This three-stage methodology applies not only to batch processing layer, but also to uh, streaming uh, processing and also machine learning use case. So after this, Marvel will talk about the two most common design patterns to build out this uh, data pipeline on a batch processing layer. Thank you, Dylan. We are now going to talk about two ways of processing your data. In the first method, extract, transform, and load, you're doing all the data transformations before storing the data into a database or data lake. In the second method, you take the data, put it into a data warehouse and, or a relational database, and then do all your transformations there. That's called extract, load, and transform. Within the AWS environment, we use an S3-centric approach for ETL. First, you have the various data sources putting their raw data directly into S3, unchanged. Then, you do your data transformations. There are a number of different tools that can be used to do this. AWS specific tools include EMR and Glue, but you could also use third party tools such as Databricks. Ultimately, you're going to get consumable data, the kind of data that can be used by, by, by various different data applications. Examples given here, such as a data warehouse of Redshift, Business Intelligence, QuickSight, and Amazon Athena, which is a high performance parallel query engine that goes directly against the data lake. Why do we recommend an S3-centric approach for ETL? Well, S3 has a lot of characteristics that make it very attractive as a data lake. It is extremely durable data. It is highly available, and the data is very scalable to many, many exabytes. There are many ways to get data into S3, and there's a broad portfolio of analytic tools that are available that work with S3. Also, S3 gives you a high degree of control, both over the individual objects and overall, it has the best security, compliance, and audit capabilities of any data lake out there. Also, S3 supports many open standard formats, open standard tools, formats, and Apache open source tools. For example, within the Apache world, it supports Flink, Hoodie, and Presto, among many others. 
Kafka is a very po popular streaming tool that integrates nicely with S3. And S3 supports a wide variety of data formats, including two of the most popular ones for data transformations, ORC and Parquet, because they're columnar and allow for compression. But as you can see here, there are a wide variety of tools and formats that are supported. Next, let's talk about ELT. Redshift is the tool of choice within AWS for ELT. We take the data into S3, just as we do with the ETL-based approach. All the raw data goes into S3. However, rather than do the transformations outside, the, trans the data is directly loaded into the Redshift data warehouse, and all the transformations are done within the data warehouse. The data within Redshift can be put into materialized views that make it consumable directly by various applications that pull data from Redshift. SageMaker is a machine learning tool. As we mentioned, QuickSight for business intelligence, uh, SQL-based tools, all different types of tools can pull data that is in direct consumable form from Redshift. Why do we recommend Redshift as an ELT tool? Well, one of the biggest advantages of Redshift is the high degree of integration it has with the data lake infrastructure S3, as well as with the relational data sources. You can do queries across relational databases, data lakes, as well as Redshift databases. This gives the ability to query exabytes of data, transactional data, all different types of data, very flexibly, conveniently, and quickly. Redshift is very performant and very scalable. With our RA3 instance types, you have the ability to scale storage independently of compute power, which allows for a very efficient way to scale up as needed if you need to store more data or if you need more compute power. It also has the ability to do concurrent access, scaling up basically unlimited as needed on demand and scaling down when it's not needed. Redshift has a high degree of security and encryption and supports all the major certifications such as SOC, PCI, and FedRAM. While it is always hard to compare directly the cost of different data warehouses, Redshift has a very predictable cost structure and is frequently about 75% cheaper than other data warehouses. Now, let's compare the ETL to the ELT approach. First, let's look at the skills required. In order to use the ETL approach, you generally need to have a good understanding of Spark. However, to use Redshift, what is needed is to understand SQL. There are a lot more developers out there that have a good understanding of SQL, and on that basis, that would be sufficient for them to do transformations within Redshift. From a scalability point of view, S3 has virtually no upper limit. You can store many exabytes of data. Now, Redshift doesn't store a small amount of data. It can store up to 16 petabytes per cluster, but that doesn't approach the limits that you have with S3. From a performance point of view, you're going to do much better with Redshift. It's designed to be extremely fast and very stable. But from a cost perspective, the S3-based approach is going to be a little bit cheaper. Both have a very high level of security, but when it comes to data formats, S3 is a data lake. You can store pretty much any type of file within S3. Whereas Redshift, as a data warehouse, has the limitations of a data warehouse. There are certain structured and semi-structured data types that are allowed, but you don't have unlimited flexibility. Both methods allow strong integration with other AWS services but S3 has far more support for third-party tools. Now let's talk about the modern data architecture, which 
is very important to both approaches as you evolve to use more and more data in more and more flexible ways. The modern data architecture is built around a scalable data lake. Around this scalable data lake, you're going to have a number of purpose-built data services that have a very specific purpose and are effective for those specific purposes. You have a seamless movement of data into the data lake from input sources and out of the data lake into the data warehouse to log analytics to machine learning tools. So data can flow in and out very easily. And also in between, you might want to have your data warehouse process information and then after the transformations, have it analyzed by a log analytics tool like Elasticsearch. Governance is also a fundamental aspect of the modern data architecture. By having a governance rate, uh, layer around your data lake, you have the ability to control exactly which data services and which users have access to specific data within the data lake. Overall, it's a very cost-effective and performant architecture. Now let's take a look at how this would map into the AWS ecosystem. As we can see within the AWS ecosystem, you start with S3 at the core. Within S3, Amazon Athena is a very fast query engine that can be used to pull data out to a number of different data services. And also AWS Glue is used for connectivity to a number of these services. AWS Lake Formation is what is used in order to control the uh, governance and access to uh, data from these various uh, data services so that they only have access to the data that they are entitled to. I hope you found this talk educational. Thank you very much.